If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy 2, 4 rather, 2 Timothy chapter 4 with me tonight, and verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul is um, charging. That's the word we use because that's the word used in the Scripture. In other words, a charge is a commission. It's a, a declaration. It's a, it's a mandate. Paul said, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Father, bless this holy book now. And I pray, Father, tonight for unction to preach what you've called me to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul is not calling Timothy to preach. Man does not call man to preach. If that's the case, then we've already lost from the beginning. Because if a man calls you to preach, then you're going to be influenced by men. You're going to be controlled by them. You're going to be browbeaten by them. You're going to be intimidated by them. And as God said to Jeremiah, He said, Don't be affected by their faces. When you get up and you begin to prophesy and preach the Word of God, preach as it is before the Lord. Preach God's Word as God has called you to preach it. So Timothy was a preacher. He was called of God to preach His Word. Let me say this tonight at the very beginning of what I'm going to say. One of the things, and probably the most important thing, that has killed the church in America is a lack of preachers. I'm talking about God called preachers. This is where I fall out with a lot of the brethren today. They're good men, they're good people. No doubt about it, they love the Lord, but they do not, they do not believe in a personal call to preach the Word of God. And my friend, I do. And I believe one of the reasons that it's killing the church today is because men that get up in the pulpit do not have a passion. They do not have a passion to preach because they don't have a call to preach. And preaching the Word of God is not something that originates from men. It's got to come down from above. God's got to put that up in your heart. He's got to call you to preach. I did not start out as a preacher. I started out as a hell-raising drunk. But then in 1973, God saved me. And when He saved me, He began to do something in my heart. And I had no idea it was coming. I didn't expect it. I had no idea what was happening to me. But I knew something past being born again was happening to me. And eventually I came face to face with the simple fact that God was calling me to preach. There's nothing I could do about it because it's a call from God. It is a divine thing. It's a thing that sets men apart in the sight of other men and women. And make no mistake about it, it's men that God calls to preach. The killing us in this house today, in the church today, in this country, is a lack of God called preachers. Men that came from the field, behind a plow, or from underneath a car as a mechanic, or as an electrician or a carpenter, or whatever job they might have been doing, a lawyer or a doctor, any of these things, they're all honorable trades. But to preach the Word of God is the utmost and highest calling that a man can have on the face of this earth. It becomes part of his being. It's part of his soul. It's the blood that courses through his veins. It's how he thinks. It's what he is. It's not a job. It's something that's part of his life. And without it, his life is incomplete. When God calls a man to preach, that man has a mandate from heaven. He knows the hand of God has been put upon his soul. And the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, preach the Word, not preach philosophy. Don't preach psychology. Don't preach psychobabble, but preach the Word. You've got a book in your hand that your grandmother and mother raised you up in fear and admonition of the Lord. You believe that book. Now take that book and preach it to men. And God Almighty will do that. He has done it and He'll do it again. Till the Lord Jesus comes back 
to this world, he will call men to preach his word. And I look forward to seeing that. And I'll tell you this right now tonight, I can't call you. If you answer the call to preach because of this preacher, you're dead wrong. Your answer to the call to preach is because of God. It's because there's no peace in your soul unless you do. It's because you know that you know that you know that God's put his hand upon your soul and calls you to preach the word of God. I've learned this from experience, from years of the ministry. That when God calls a man to preach, he will call people to hear him. They'll come. They'll come from here. They'll come from the four corners of the earth to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Because it's different. You can go to a college and get a lecture. You can go to a school teacher and have somebody lecture you. And there's nothing wrong with lectures, but that's not preaching. My friends, preaching and teaching are two entirely different things. I'm called to preach. I'm also called to teach. Being a pastor, I have a responsibility to teach to you every Sunday and Lord willing Wednesday night and so forth to teach God's word but that does not take the place of preaching. Preaching is a mandate from on high. It's what puts the spirit in the church of God. It sets it afire. It lights its soul. It's the moving of God in the heart of men for them to hear a man of God get up in the pulpit, open up his word and know that God is speaking through that man. That There's nothing like that on the face of this earth. I get hungry to hear preaching. I get hungry to hear a man of God get up and preach his word. I get so sick and tired of these guys sitting on stools and just talking to people as if that's a message from God. That's no message from God. Anybody can do that. But a call from God to preach is for you get in your prayer closet on your face before God. Get your heart right with God. Get God Almighty to move in your soul and the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And then you open up his word and you begin to preach the word of God. <laughs> so the last thing that the Apostle Paul wanted Tim, Timothy to understand because he was about ready to leave this world. Timothy... Preach the word. Amen. The greatest preacher that ever walked the face of this earth is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is plainly called a preacher of the word of God. He preached the scripture. And and they said of him, he does not speak as the Pharisees do. He doesn't talk as the religious leaders do. He speaks with authority. And the reason he did is because God called him to preach his word. That's what we're dying for. We got movies galore. We got big screen TVs everywhere. We've got all kinds of drama. We've got musicals. We've got everything under the sun. But we don't have power in the church. And the reason we don't have power in the church is because there's no man in the pulpit preaching the word of God. The apostle Paul told him in 2 Timothy 4, he said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And he said after their own lust shall they heap to themselves Teachers having itching ears, teach to us, speak to us smooth things. Well, there's a smooth talker in Houston, Illinois, in Houston, Texas, and that smooth talker has tens of thousands sitting around him week in and week out, and I've listened to him time and again, and I have never heard him say one thing that has any substance to it, and I've never heard him preach the Word of God, and the reason I haven't and you will never hear him preach is because he's not called to preach, and I seriously doubt that he knows anything about salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. For that's the first step. Until you've been born again, you'll never preach. So the apostle said, Timothy, preach the word. If you don't have a Bible in your hands that you believe, that burns your heart when you read it, a book that you don't go in to criticize, but you let it criticize you. If you don't have a Bible that is, you approach that Bible with reverence because you say that is God's word. It is not my place to correct this book. It's my place to to believe it and pray for the Holy Spirit to illuminate it to my soul. And if you can't do that with the Bible, forget it, friend. Close it, shut up, and go home because you'll never preach the Word of God. But if you believe the Bible and you believe that you hold in your hands the inspired Word of God, that from cover to cover it is, it is a book without error. And I'm talking about this King James Bible I've got in my hands, folks. That book is perfect. I've heard a lot of cocky smart Alex down through the years come along and say, well, now let me show you the mistakes in the Bible. But I have yet to see one single mistake ever pointed out to me in that King James Bible. And I challenge all the cocky smart Alex tonight to show me a mistake. It's not in there. 
It, not, it can't be found because it's not in the book. This is God's preserved word. If you take that book and you take that book and you enter into a battle with that book to fight the good fight of faith, you'd better have confidence in that book. When you go in the military and they hand you a weapon and you know how to use that weapon, you better have confidence in that weapon because that weapon's the difference in life and death for you. Well, this weapon right here that I hold in my hand, this is the sword of the Spirit. If I don't have faith in that Bible, what in the world am I going to preach to you? What am I going to preach to you? Am I going to give you a bunch of psycho babble, tell you how good you are, tell you how beautiful you are, tell you how you ought to love yourself? You hear that all week long. When you come to the house of God and hear the preaching of the Word of God, you need to hear the truth about yourself. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's nothing beautiful about me. I'm ugly all over. The only beauty in me is the beauty of holiness that the Holy Spirit plants in my soul when He saved me by the grace of God. Amen. So preach to Paul, said to Timothy, the Word of God. Notice what he said in verse 1. And he said, And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, had his appearing in his kingdom. He has both resurrections. Here in the first verse of the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, both resurrections, the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. Now notice carefully. He said, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Who's he talking to, preacher? He must be talking to a bunch of lost people. No, he's talking to apostates. The Apostle Paul is telling us that in the last days that the church will become so apostate that it will reject the preaching of the Word of God. An unsaved man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2.14. They're foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. An unsaved man has no idea what doctrine is about, whether it's right doctrine or wrong doctrine. But the Apostle Paul here says, they will not accept sound doctrine, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. That is apostasy. What is apostasy, preacher? Apostasy is when a professing Christian turns away from the truth of the Word of God and they go back into this world and find themselves a teacher that makes them feel good about themselves and lets them live the lifestyle they want to live comfortably. There are churches galore. As a matter of fact, they are in the majority now that you can go into these churches, you can sit there in the pew, and you can live any way you please, and they'll always make you feel good about yourself before you walk out that back door. Are you that big a fool? Do you want to be deceived that bad? Are you hurting that bad? Do you want somebody to tell you something like that when you know your life is not right and you know you're not right with God, and yet when you go to your church, you feel good about yourself when you leave there? That's sick. That's apostasy. That's horrible. That when we preach the Bible, the Word of God itself will plow up fallow ground. It will plow it up and then the seed can be put into it. And you put the seed into the fallow ground and then God Almighty will send somebody else to water that seed and then God Himself will give the increase. And when God gives the increase, fruit starts coming out of your life. Your marriages are put back together again. You realize we got marriages breaking up here in this church. You understand we got people, young people in their 20s and their 30s, hadn't been married any time and now they're breaking up. And I'm not, it's not just now, I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again. And it's not because of some terrible sin in the marriage, it's because they just can't get along with each other. They just don't understand each other. They can't communicate. Let me tell you the best way to communicate with your wife or your husband. Get a hold of each other by the hand. Get down on your knees. Lay the Bible down between you and say, Lord God Almighty, help me understand her and help her to understand me and put a camaraderie between the two of us and a union that joins us together as husband and wife. Lord, we said words and preachers said words over us, but Lord, we will want you to join us together as husband and wife. That'll make your marriage work. That'll make it work. And you have to make it work. But the only way your marriage will ever work is when you put an effort into it and put God right in the middle of it and then call upon Him and ask Him to do something in your marriage that will make it work. And God will bless it. But people don't do that today. They don't want to do that today. Do you realize that four out of ten children born in this country, four out of ten, four out of ten in the whole country are born without a parent, without, without, born into illegitimacy. I don't know what the word to say for it. They don't have a home. They don't have a mom and a dad. They got a single mother. 
Four out of ten children born in this country. You say that's an awful stigma to put on a child. Child didn't choose that. Mom and dad chose that. Mom and dad are the ones who chose to fornicate. Mom and dad are the ones who brought that child into this world. But the sad thing is that mom and dad can do as they please and ten years down the road be doing something else. But that child is born into that for the rest of its life. How selfish can anybody be? Amen. How selfish can anybody be? And turn it over to the liberal news media, the spin meisters, and they make it all look good. But it's not good. It's horrible. It's terrible. I watch a family right now that's going through some of the worst hell you ever saw in your life. I'm talking about stuff that blow your mind. And I'm not about to get up here and reveal it and divulge it to you. I'm a pastor. I've got a responsibility to maintain, a, 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 you know, a secrecy about certain things. It's not public knowledge. But I know what's happening when it destroys children. I watch it destroy children right now. I'm watching little kids as they are literally destroyed in their heart and in their soul. And it is not their fault. It is the fault of sin. Sin destroys. It, it guts the soul of a child. I can identify with a child like that because that's the way I was raised up. I was four years old when I walked out the door and left a drunk mother laying in a sofa. I was four years old when I walked out the front door and took my little two-year-old brother by the hand and we went about three or four miles, five miles, whatever it was, to get to my grandfather's house. I'll never forget that. It was pouring the rain down, and we covered our heads up with blankets, and we walked up, and we walked up the road, and the people were standing on the side of the road, and they said, what are you two kids doing out here? We never answered them. I wanted to get my little brother into shelter. He was hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry, he said. Why was my mother lying drunk? Why would we have no home? Seeing, that's why. That's the answer. It's not some curse you have on your family or your generation. It is S-I-N. And believe me, friend, mom and dad can pick up and start up new relationships and have new homes and new families and new, and new, and new husbands and new wives, but the children that are born into that are going to pay for it the rest of their life. I got scars in my soul that some people have no idea. They could never imagine sometimes what I feel at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes when I feel, where was my dad? Why did I never have a daddy? Why can't I ever even remember his voice? Why was I allowed to see certain things that my mother did? Why did my eyes have to observe that? Why was I subjected to that as a child? Why, God, why? And then the Lord comes to me and says, I love you, son. You can't change the past. That you had nothing to do with that. And, I, and then God also says, and I understand the scar in your soul. I understand how you feel. And I know that you've been hurt. And I know it's deep. And I know it will always be there for the rest of your life. This garbage you hear from these people saying, when they say to you, uh, they say, closure. What are you talking about, closure? You don't know what the real world is about. The real world is it will stay with you till you die. But I'm so glad he comes to me and says, son, I know how you feel and I love you anyway. In your mind, I called you. I love you. I died for you. And I'm going to make it possible for you to live with this. Now, come on. Let's go together. Let's go forward together. And he comes to me and he takes hold of me and he blesses me. And I said, thank you, Lord. You're a daddy to me. You're a mother to me. You're everything I ever wanted to be. You're everything I ever needed. You're mine. Hallelujah to God. And I know you'll never leave me but forsake me. It'll never happen to me again like it did before. You don't think things like that affect your kids? You don't think a little child is scarred by stuff like that? You're dead wrong. You're living in la-la land. You're, you're, you're deceiving yourself. Your hardened heart that justifies everything you want to do, you're causing these kids to suffer because of what you're doing, and then you change later on, but they have to live with it the rest of their lives. I'm so glad for the love of God. <laughs> oh, how I am. You wouldn't believe what a road I was on. You wouldn't believe how dark my world was. You wouldn't believe where I was headed. You wouldn't believe what kind of a lifestyle I had until God came to me. And when he came directly to me, he came to me. And he didn't come to me through a bunch of religious hypocrites. He didn't come to me through a bunch of pious Pharisees. He came to me. And when he came to me, he got my attention. And glory to God, it was just a few days after that I got on my face and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he saved me. Hallelujah to God. And uh, you'd be surprised at how many so-called reverends in this country don't have a clue what it means to be born again. That's what's killing us. But I do, I do, I do, I do. 
I do, I do, I do. And you wonder why I constantly bring, I mention that again because I live with it every day of my life. Friends, I live with it. Some of you people in this house tonight, you've got some of the finest mothers that ever lived. Some of you got the, some of the finest daddies that ever lived. You ought to get up every day of your life and say, thank you, Lord, for a mother and a father like I've got. Lord God, this is a gift from God. There's no way into the world. You ought to say to the Lord, thank you for the mother that you gave me, for the father that you gave me. But some of you, you'll never understand what that means because you took it for granted from day one. You took it for granted to have a mother and a father like you've got. You took it for granted. Well, brother, you come up the way I did, you won't take it for granted. I'll guarantee you right. I'll guarantee you that to grow up in a family where the, where the siblings come in, the aunts and the uncles, and they all want to whip you. They want to beat on you. They want to treat you like a dog. All of them have you nothing but contempt for you. They don't want you there to begin with. They don't want their mother and their father raising their sister's children. They want you out. You sense that. I felt it in my soul. No friend from any of them. And that's the kind of life I live. That's where I live. That's why I was so defensive to begin with. From day one, four years old, I learned how to fight and survive. That's rough, isn't it, folks? Can you believe a preacher went through a life like that? Some of you went through the same thing. Some of you did. But some of you have been blessed beyond measure. God only knows how I envy you to have a mother read the Bible to you and pray with you. To have a father get up and go to work every day and come home and you see him as he leaves and you see him as he comes back and you got a father that knows that you know loves you. A father that would lay his life down for you. How blessed you are. You may live in a $10,000 house and, 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 and drive a, a rattle trap for a car, but if you got a mother and a father like that, you are rich. Amen. You are rich. Amen. You are rich. This is why when we have Mother's Day, I don't get excited because I never had one. We have Father's Day. It's no big deal to me. The only father I ever knew was a grandfather. And my father in heaven preached the word, Timothy. That's the only thing that will break this bondage of sin. That's the only thing that will give a home to the children. That's the only thing that will take a drunken dad and get him sober and get him right with God. That's the only thing that will take a wayward mother and bring her back and make her be what she ought to be. Children want a home so bad. Oh, my, how I watch this thing progress through generation after generation. Oh, how little children want a home so bad. Mommy, why don't you live with Daddy? Daddy, why don't you live with Mommy? Little four and five and six-year-old children, you don't think they have a soul? But this jaded generation today doesn't care anything about their nothing but their pleasure, their personal peace their prosperity, and finding a church that will make them feel good about themselves while they live like hell. Is that the truth? It is the truth. And what you ought to do is say, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that you still have your churches in America. And folks, they're here. Believe me, God's men are all over this country. You still have your churches in America that are resisting the tide that, are, that will absolutely refuse to become part of this apostasy that's sweeping the nation and the world and will preach the truth to me and to my family and to my children and my parents and my home. Timothy, preach the Word. I want you to notice something else about it. He said in verse 5, Watch thou in all things and do afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. I've preached from the back of pickup trucks. I've preached on bridges. I've preached everywhere I guess you can imagine. If, if time may get up on top of the house and preach, who knows? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter to me. The venue is not important. But I have done the work of an evangelist. I've held revival meetings. I've traveled at night, come home worn out, all week long revivals. Let me tell you something tonight. An evangelist does not have an easy job. An evangelist is moving about all the time. He's going from one place to the next. He doesn't come home every night. The evangelist is out preaching the Word of God, ministering. 
I used to think about Ed Blue when he was up here in the pulpit preaching. I thought, Brother Blue, he's pastor. He pastored three or four or five churches, but he spent years on the road as an evangelist. That's a hard life. He's gone, his family, his two daughters, they're at home with his wife, and here they are without him. Where is he? He's out preaching the Word of God. He's doing the work of an evangelist. The pastor's job and the evangelist's job are two different things. The burdens of an evangelist and the burdens of a pastor are entirely two different things. A pastor has responsibility to week after week after week after week to keep something before you, to stimulate your mind, to make you think, to let you know that there's more going on than what's going on inside the four walls of this building. He has to teach you. Then he has to pastor you. He has to preach the Word. He has to be there when you're sick. He has to be there when you're dying. He's got to be there. He has to put his personal feelings aside. He's got to be faithful. If he's going to be a man of God that's a pastor of a local assembly, he'd better have your heart in his heart. He'd better feel for you and want for you and want to do for you and put his feelings aside. If he's been offended, if he's been hurt, forget it. If you're going to pastor a church, you've got to have everybody on the same level. You can't have any picks and sweethearts and, and, and big eyes and little use. And I have nothing but contempt for preachers have, have, who, who cater to, 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 to wealthy people. And, 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 and I watched one die because he catered to wealthy people. And that's the one that I knew of. And I no doubt, no doubt in my mind that throughout this nation, God has put many of them away because they forgot what they were in that pulpit for. I'm not up here to cater to wealthy people. Let's say you make $20,000 a year. Let's say you make $200,000 a year. Do you think I should make a difference between the one who makes $20,000 and the one who makes $200,000? Some churches do. And some pastors do. Why? Because they're interested in building this great work for God. They want to put all these buildings in ministry. And they want to reach out. No, blah, blah, blah. What they're trying to do is build their name and leave their legacy behind. And what somebody needs to do is go out and build this huge concrete monument and put a big picture of them up at the top and say, this is what you want after all, anyway. Isn't this what it's all about? And let's just get us an altar out here and let's all bow down. <laughs> What are we going to do when you're gone? Oh, Lord. What's going to happen to the church when this great man of God is gone? Let me tell you what will happen to it. It will sail right on. The ship of Zion knows who, its, knows who its captain is, and it's not going to be persuaded one way or the other. Amen. You say that's a rough assessment. It probably is a little rough. But the truth of the matter is so much of what's going on inside of a church house today is nothing in the world more than religious politics. All right where they're trying to get as much money as they can because they have all these burdens and all these ministries. And it's kind of like the seed sowers, you know, sow into this ministry. I found out the other day about one of these TV evangelists. He's got something like a 20, 20, 20, 30 million dollar jet. Well, that ain't good enough. Now God's called him to get a bigger jet. And how much was it that this new one cost? $60 million. Amen. Let's get a hat out and start passing tonight. How, how long would it take us to raise $60 million? So what they needed for, preacher, so he could fly everywhere. Well, he could already fly everywhere. Yes, but he can fly higher and faster. It's bigger. It's prestige. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's keeping up with the Joneses. Of course, you understand now that this TV evangelist, once he's got a $60 million jet, can you imagine the pressure on so-and-so on down the line? When she has to come and look at her little $30 million jet, she's going to say to herself, well, I'm not near as important as he is until I get an $80 million jet. And on and on and on and on it goes. That's pastoring. The evangelist, he's got a different ministry altogether. He's out on the road, sometimes sleeping in trailers, sometimes sleeping in campers. Sometimes he, sometimes he sleeps in what's called, in what's called uh, prophet's quarters in, ha in, in the churches. Some of the prophets' quarters are nice, but I've had, past, I've had evangelists say to me, I've slept in prophets' quarters, and I'll tell you right now, there was more in there than a prophet. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have. I have. That's the truth. There was more in there than me. And, uh, and that happens. In other words, they have a burden too. I haven't had to live like that. God's been good to me. He's blessed me. But the evangelist has a burden in his ministry that's a different ministry than a pastor. It's altogether different. And none of it's easy. None of it's easy. If you are going to preach the Word, if you're going to minister to people tonight, let me tell you the first thing that you've got to get and get it right. You better put your personal feelings aside. You better get that chip off your shoulder. 
And you better and you better and you better quit this idea of walking around saying, "Well, people don't appreciate me if they only realized how much talent I've got and how great I am." You know, we, things would be going a whole lot smoother. No, forget that. I'm a servant of the Lord, and I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, that's the ideal situation. Does it always work that way? No. Sometimes I'm a devil. <laughs> Sometimes my old flesh rises up and say, boy, they didn't appreciate a thing you did today. You didn't get any appreciation. You didn't get this. You didn't get that. It's not that I personally say it, but I got those darts, those fiery darts. I know you all never had anything like that, but those fiery darts, they come shooting at you. You know what you say? Shut up, you devil. You're a liar. You're a father of lies. You're a liar from the beginning. That's me, old man. That's the flesh. Lord Jesus, I'm just thankful that you gave me a place to preach your word. And your attitude tonight should be that, Lord Jesus, thank you that I've got a church to go to where I don't have to rock and I don't have to roll and I don't have to rap. I can come in there and I don't have to worry about some great big giant screen sitting back and looking at another TV movie. I just left that. I didn't go to the house of God for that. I came in here to hear the Word of God. And I get this stuff all the time from people everywhere. Look at them, folks. Look at them. Everywhere out here, we don't have a church anywhere where we live. There's nowhere to go. What do we do, preacher? So they watch us on YouTube. And then they say, preacher, would you please pray for me? We're going to try to move to Knoxville. That's a big thing, to pluck up and move all the way to Knoxville, Tennessee, so that they can come to a church that they've met on the Internet. I've had him say to him, preacher, I see your choir. I feel that power. I feel that spirit. Preacher, there's something coming out of that church. There's something in there. And that's what I want. And so I pray for them. It's sad, isn't it? Because they had churches at one time there, but their churches are gone. They're no longer. Oh, they've got rock and roll and rap churches, but they don't have a church like this. I had rather tonight come here to Temple Baptist Church and meet with five people that want to meet the old-fashioned way. I was reading one of the arrogant smart Alex the other day, and he said this, and I'm talking about a pastor. Here's what he said. He said, it's a pity at how these churches are languishing out here that are not part of the times, that they are, that they are languishing because they're not part of the movement. He said, it is a pity that some of them will stay with that until they die. They are irrelevant. And then I say back to him, let me tell you something. The minute you become a rock and roll, entertainment palace, feel good situation, and you're rocking and you're rolling and you're rapping, you are no longer relevant because you have ceased to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And you are part of the problem in the country. Amen. That's part of the problem, not the solution and not the answer. If I wasn't pastoring Temple Baptist Church, I'd find me a church somewhere that was just like Temple Baptist Church. Now, there's one up there in Kentucky I watch all the time. Amen. Uh, Bingham. I watch, that, I watch him get up there and preach. I listen to that choir sing, and something stirs inside my soul. And I've thought a few times of just calling up on Sunday morning saying, folks, I can't help it. I'm going to church up there. I want to see what they're going to do today. <laughs> but I need to be here. <laughs> this is where I need to be. But you can believe this, that if, if, if I were anywhere near, uh, what is that in Kentucky? Mid, mid, what's the, the town? Middlesboro. Yeah, Middlesboro. If I was anywhere near Middlesboro, Kentucky on a Sunday morning, <laughs> guess where I'd be? I'd be, sta I'd be sitting front and center listening to the Word of God and listening to that beautiful choir. And those people up there in Kentucky, I don't know tonight, I'm sure they do, I'm sure they realize what they got. I'm sure they realize what they've got. They've got a church, the old-fashioned, old-timey old preaching, old-timey singing, the old-fashioned Spirit of God, they're up there shouting and glorifying God. They've got something up there. And folks, 
I want you here at Temple Baptist Church. Please, 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 please. If I'm going out of here and God calls me and my time's up, as the apostle said, my, time, my, my time's finished. I, fought, I finished my course. If my time's up and I'm gone, please don't turn this into a rock and roll and rap hell hole. Right. If you get a pastor in this church, the first thing you want to ask that man, do you believe in the old time fashion singing? Amen. Do you still use hymnals? Yes. Do you still use hymnals? Do you believe in preaching? What do you believe about the Bible? You say, well, we need to see whether he's a Ph.D. or not. Or a T no, 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 no. Nothing against Ph.D.s and Th.D.s and the rest of them. Nothing against that. But that doesn't qualify you for anything. What qualifies you is this blessed book right here. Whether you believe it. Whether you believe it. Hallelujah to God. You know something? I'll tell you, be honest with you from my heart tonight. I really do believe this. I believe you would. I believe you'd get you a man in this house that would preach the truth, that would stick with the book. I believe it. I believe with all my heart. You know why? Just like the preaching I preached to you tonight, this would run a lot of people off. <laughs> it would run them out. They'd run them back into the arms of the feel-good rock rap, uh, rock and roll crowd. Yes, it would. It would run them back. But you've endured. <laughs> the Sunday night crowd's kind of like the ones who've been tempered. The steel's been put in the furnace. They've been tempered. 2,700 degrees melts mild steel, somewhere thereabout. All right, you've made your steel. But you want to temper it. At 2,700, it's soft steel. See, it's mild steel. It's what you build and construct with and so forth. I mean, it's hard, but... Tempered steel is steel that has been reheated to an exact temperature that hardens it even more. That tempers it. And that's what's happened on Sunday night. You folks get tempered. <laughs> and then Wednesday night, the last step is this. First you create the steel, mild steel. Then you temper it. But then if you're going to form it into something, you may take that steel and you, pay, you may put it into a thing that's like a press. Some of them pound like that. It's called a forge. <laughs> and literally you're pounding, you're forging, you're, you're forcing the molecular structure of that steel together. And you're, and you're, and you're creating uh, from that a, a very useful artifact, a lot of things. Be it you driving an automobile, I'm sure you've got forged parts on there, forged steel. You've got tempered parts in it. You've got mild steel. And that forging process is the final when you are literally conformed to the image of Christ. And I can't do that. The Holy Ghost has to do that. I hope you've got in your heart tonight a love for Temple Baptist Church. We're changing things. It's not the same. I hope I don't hear somebody say, well, that used to be a pretty good church down there on Woodrow Drive, but now they're modern. <laughs> so what do you mean modern? Well, go look at those walls and that ceiling. Whoever thought of a thing like that? How could you have a ceiling like that in a church? Why couldn't you have? I thought it's pretty. I kind of liked it. How many of you kind of got used to this ceiling up here? Our builder sitting over there said this. He said, if you put a sheetrock up here, do a, a sheetrock ceiling, okay? Just plain sheetrock, the size of this building. He said, you could stand at one end and you'd see this. Because it's not, you know, the rafters aren't perfectly on the same plane. So the sheetrock follows the rafter. But when you do it like this, you still got this, but that's beautiful. <laughs> I guess I'm right. Am I right, brother? All right. You see what it does? Amen. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> well, you see what we're going to do back here. <laughs> would some of you had a heart? Would some of you have a heart attack if we put stained glass back here? I mean, that's a nice scene, but I've been looking at it for 35 years. <laughs> I know every tree, every rock, every fish, everything in that thing. <laughs> Believe me, I know that picture good, and I appreciate the brother that did it. That's an oil painting. He came over here and it took him something like two or three weeks to paint all that. And I appreciate that. But that was 35 years ago. 
it's, it's kind of time to redecorate, don't you think? Amen. So y'all pray about that. I had a man say to me one time, and I'll close with this. He said, uh, he said, we got into a building program, and he said, we dug up the devil. <laughs> well, back then it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I thought, you dug up the devil. And then, it, then, then after a while you start thinking about, oh yeah, okay, you're changing things. Okay, I got it. When you start making changes, some folks get very uncomfortable. They don't like changes. Folks, I personally believe that what's happened so far is beautiful. Amen. I really do. And the, and the acoustics in this house are 10,000 times better than they used to be. But I think it's beautiful, and it's just the beginning. And they're laying the foundation already back here in the back, building onto this building. And all of this from behind me on back now, all this is going to change. And it's going to work together to complement what you're looking at. And I think you're going to like it. I pray by the grace of God that you do. But nothing, here's what's not going to change. The preaching of the Word of God. And this place is going to be old-fashioned as much as it possibly can be as long as I'm here. By the grace of God. Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stand tonight and preach your word. Use it, Lord, for the glory of God. Bless our brothers and our sisters who came tonight, those who are watching this thing over the Internet, those who will watch it later. I pray it's helpful to somebody, especially some young man out there right now that's got a burning desire in his soul to preach your word, but he's been discouraged by his denomination or by some men or his school, or his friends, or his family. But there's no peace in his soul. He knows you've called him to preach. I say to that young man right now, if you're listening to this, preach. It'll be the best move you ever made in your life. Preach his word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand up tonight, brother. Page three.